Thank you guys for coming out today. Uh, somehow I assumed there would be 10 people here because it was so early. Um, my name is Yancey, as Craig said. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Kickstarter. I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about what it is that we do um, and sort of why we do it the way that we do. And at the end, we'll have time for questions. So first thing you know is that Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects. And both of those words are important. By creative, uh, the kinds of things that happen on Kickstarter are films, music, art, photography, food, comics. We don't allow any sort of charitable or cause-based fundraising. It all has to be you're making something. And the word project is really important too. We don't allow open-ended fundraising. Everything has to be a precisely defined project with a beginning and an end. A project you know, is finite. It produces something. So both those things are really important to how we work. The other thing about Kickstarter is that all the funding is all or nothing. So when you start a project, you set how much money you want to raise, and you give yourself an amount of time to do it, generally 30 days or so. And so you can see in this project, this is to put on a 24-hour cycle of waiting for Godot. If this person didn't raise any more money, they have, you know, they're $600 or $575 short of their goal. They didn't raise any more money, no one is ever charged, and nothing ever happens. Everyone just walks away. But in this case, and in every case like this, this project was funded, and those backers were charged, and, and the play went on. Uh, Kickstarter has been around for about two years, and during that time, it's, it's had some success. We've had over 9,000 successfully funded projects. Uh, collectively, Kickstarter products have raised more than $70 million. Right now, over $2 million a week is being pledged, and over 700,000 people have contributed to these projects, 100,000 people to more than one. And here you can see how Kickstarter makes its money. If a, if a project is successfully funded, we take 5% of what they raised. If they come up short of their goal, we don't get anything either. But one really surprising thing is that even though all the funding is all or nothing, the point at which a project is almost certain to make it is when it's raised just 30% of its funding goal. So if you're trying to raise $1,000 and you're able to raise $300, over 90% of the time your project will eventually make it. This graph shows how, how projects approach 100% funding as they go up. Even a project that raises 10% of its goal will succeed 75% of the time. So basically your idea needs to have that core audience behind it. If it does, you have a really, really good shot of making it. And if you look at how the money breaks down, a couple slides ago I showed that the success rate is 44%, but 85% of the money goes to projects that eventually make it. So it's really feast or famine, and we think this is a great endorsement of the all or nothing model, because there's not a lot of money that's being left on the table. Money is going to ideas that everyone is agreeing are the right ones for it to happen. Um, so I think that this is, this is a, a nice dynamic, and this has been consistent ever since we launched. Um, so what is it about Kickstarter that makes it work. I mean, why is it that these things happen? And there are a lot of reasons, but the one that I think is most compelling is that every project is a story. Each Kickstarter project is a narrative of a real person doing something important or something meaningful, something they care about. And we get to follow along. We get to act as an audience. And all these projects are doing, these, you know, these are people talking to their audience as peers. These are people just like you and I trying to raise money, trying to, to build support for their idea from people just like you and I. And these stories are told in a couple ways. And the first and most important is the project video. So 80% of Kickstarter projects at this point launch with the video, and we're very much a video-driven site. People land on the page, they hit play, they want to see what's there. And the Kickstarter video is a very interesting medium. I think it's a medium unto itself at this point. And I think of it as the anti-commercial, because it's definitely a, an ad. It's an ad for an idea or for a person or some sort of, some sort of effort they're trying to make. But people don't like to be too slick. They like to keep in the false starts and the weird mistakes to show that they're just regular people, that they feel just as uncomfortable with this as we probably would in a similar situation. Um, to give you an idea of how project videos kind of work, we put together a little montage of sort of the typical Kickstarter video. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Hello, Kickstarters. Hey. Hello. I thought we were going to do hello. Hi. I love your new shoes. Are those new shoes? Hi, my name is Raquel, and I'm totally naked. Yay! And I could go on, but this is a Kickstarter campaign video, and I haven't even told you what my project is yet. 
would like to help my dad publish a children's story. We get together and we do a podcast. Right House Musical. Stop motion animations. Let people actually be able to buy a couture dress that they themselves design. This time I decided to write things that were more lyrical. I made a film called Codependent Lesbian Space Alien Seek Same. Right now I'm sitting on over 200 hours of incredible footage. I'd like your help to complete it. Kickstarter does not work without you. We need you to be a part of this. This is a collaborative experience. Your support, of course, will not go unrewarded. We've got CDs, posters, t-shirts. I think together, uh, we can literally be the next great frontier in space and Earth exploration. Let's go make a story. I'm really excited for this. I think that this is worth doing. We can make it together. Thanks, Thanks for watching you. our Kickstarter video. video. This project is really important to me, and any support is greatly appreciated. So you see a lot of faces, a lot of stories, a lot of silliness. This is really how these videos feel. And the other way that the stories are told are with project rewards. So Kickstarter is not a donation platform. If I give you $10, I get $10 of something in return, and it's up to you to define what that is. The one thing we don't allow is any sort of equity or, or money changing hands. There's no financial return. Instead, it's things like if I'm writing a book, you get a copy of the book. Or maybe I name a character after you. Or maybe you get to visit the set. Or you come to the studio, you do the hand claps on track two. Whatever it is that you want to offer to bring people more deeply into that experience. And people get really creative with these things. Um, this, this slide that you see behind here is a Polaroid picture. This is the best reward I've gotten from a Kickstarter project so far. There's a woman named Emily Richmond. Uh, who very early in Kickstarter's history launched a project as part of an, as part of an art project to sail around the world alone. It's going to take her two years to do it. And one of her rewards was for $15. At some point on her trip, she would take a Polaroid picture, and she would mail it to you from whatever port she, she next pulled into. So about two months ago, I got a, a beat-to-hell envelope with weird stamps on it, and I opened it up, and inside is this picture. It's a jungle and a beach in the, in the, in the background. And it was folded up inside of a map. And on one side of the map, she had circled the island in the South Pacific where she was. On the other side, she had written a letter describing where she was sitting in the jungle. It's incredibly romantic. And I paid $15 for it. And I'm just some creepy guy on the internet. And she's out there. <laughs> she's out there in the Pacific Ocean. But I get to be a part of this story. I have this greater connection. It's something I will keep in my dresser mirror for the rest of my life. And these moments are the kinds of things that are happening to Kickstarter very, very regularly. Um, so to give you an idea of how projects work, I'm going to talk about the two biggest projects uh, in our history, and, and then one other. So the first is a project called Blue Like Jazz. And there's a, there's a collection of essays that was a New York Times bestseller about 10 years ago called Blue Like Jazz. And last year, September 16, 2010, the author of that book, Donald Miller, wrote on his blog that despite working on turning the, film, turning the book into a film for three years, they lost their funding. The, the institutional money, the Hollywood money that was going to fund this thing pulled out the last second. They didn't think the idea was valuable. And so two fans of the book were reading this blog post, and, and, and they weren't willing to accept that. And so they reached out to Donald Miller, and they said, hey, if we wanted to try to save this film, how much money would you need? And he said that they would need about $125,000. So the two guys, Jonathan and Zach, they decided to start a Kickstarter project to try to save the film. Fast forward five weeks later, and they had raised almost $350,000 to make the film. The film will be opening in theaters this fall. Production just finished about a month ago. And so why is it that people got involved in this? Well, A, you know, the internet loves to save things. It makes us feel magnanimous and huge. But also, you got great things. You see, for $10, you get to download the movie. Everyone who backed this project gets a personal phone call saying thank you from Steve Taylor, the director, who I don't think was bargaining for 4,500 phone calls, uh, which he's still making. I actually visited him in Portland, and they had this huge binder, just a list of people's names and phone numbers, and he was just crossing them off as he went through. And I flipped through and found my mom's name and started for him. I said, call her next. Uh, but for any amount of money you got, you got a phone call from the director. For $100, he got to be an associate producer on the film. 799 people did that, 799 associate producers on this film. And so they have a story. They're a part of this. Whenever this film comes out, this is their movie, just as much as it is Donna Miller and Steve Taylor and all these people. But also, Kickstarter can work kind of as a pre-order platform. So the biggest project that we've had is a project called the TikTok, and it was created by a designer named Scott Wilson, who's based in Chicago. And basically, he had this idea to create a watch strap to turn an iPod Nano into a wristwatch. Here you could see the designs. And so he had this idea, and he went around to you know, all the places you go to, the iPod manufacturer, you know, accessories, all that sort of stuff. And everyone said no. They all said, no one's going to want this. The price point is too high. We just, we just can't see doing this. 
So Scott put up a Kickstarter project to try to raise $15,000. He wanted to do a run of a couple hundred of these at that point, going through the manufacturing process would make it worthwhile. And four weeks later, his project finished, having raised $940,000. So in this case, these 13,512 people all were pre-ordering a TikTok. They were buying it directly from Scott. And what they got with that TikTok, they didn't just get the watch. They also got a story. They got something, they got bragging rights. Whenever someone asks them about that watch, and you know that they're hoping that someone asks them about their watch every day, they get to tell this great story about this thing they got to be a part of. And for Scott, he all of a sudden, he got a million dollars. He got a million dollars to make this thing that he wasn't sure about. Now, it's not like that extra $930,000 put him on a boat somewhere. Uh, instead, that money goes to making more watches, and certainly his margins get better, and I'm, I'm sure he cleared some money off of this, as he should. And even best of all for him, the sweetest revenge is that a month ago, the watch went on sale in the Apple store. So despite everyone saying no, he went his own way, he created his own story, and it still worked out. Another project that's a, that's a very different kind of project is called the Mysterious Letters. This is, this is one of my favorite projects we've ever had. And, you know, we have these big, we have these big things, the blue light jazzes, the, the TikToks, but a lot of what happens are, are smaller projects, more... Uh, well, I, I don't want to call this one humble because it's, it's, a, it's a big idea, but, but ones that are a little more whimsical. And so this, The Mysterious Letters, is an art project, and it's by uh, a guy and a girl named Michael and Linka. And Michael and Linka decided what they needed to do is they needed to write a personal letter to every person in the world. So they started off with a small village in Scotland, and on one day, 500 people in that village all got a letter, all from just signed Michael and Linka, same day. And the letters were bizarre. They said all kinds of weird things. I'll, I'll show you a couple of them. Uh, we'll see if you can read this. Um, so people got, people got letters like this, and they freaked the hell out. People were so afraid. Here's another one. I'll read the top. Uh, Dear Ignaz, I once decided to count up to 3, 300,027. This is the point at which I gave up. Love, Lenka and Michael. So they just sent these whimsical things, and they used the Kickstarter project to fund the paper and the postage and all that. They've done a village in, in Ireland. Uh, they've done a neighborhood in Pittsburgh where people got really scared, really scared. Uh, they had to, the people in the town afterwards hung up signs saying, don't worry, it was an art project. No kidding. Um, but so they just do things like this. Just, you know, it's just a silly thing, and Kickstarter really allows this to happen, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so again, I, I return to this idea. Every Kickstarter project is a story. That's what's amazing about these things. You get, you get to connect with it. You get to appreciate it, not just about the money. It's about everything else that they're doing. It's about just being amazed at what people have the drive and ambition to do and the fact that they can pull it off. So not every project succeeds on Kickstarter, and the ones that fail, I think, fail for, for reasons that kind of make sense. Um, generally, they're people looking for a little bit too much money. Or maybe they're trying to do something where they have no history in that world before. You know, I can't put up and say I'm making a documentary film and try to raise 20 grand if I have no, you know, no track record of doing that. And so the projects that fail, you know, are generally people who need to come back and do a little bit more work, or people who are presenting this as a, as a business proposal rather than just something they really care about that would be a lot cooler if they could do it with you. Of course, not every project that fails, you know, a lot of projects that fail should have made it, but the ones that do, they're, they're things they have in common. Um, and so... The last thing I want to talk about is who we are. Um, we, have a, we have an unusual story. Uh, we're not a, a typical startup by any means. Um, the idea for Kickstarter uh, came to my partner and our CEO, Perry Chen, about 10 years ago. He was living in New Orleans. He was trying to put on a concert, and he, he didn't have enough money to do it. And he thought, if only I knew how many people were interested beforehand, I could set a threshold. And if enough people wanted it to happen, it would happen. If, it, if they didn't, it wouldn't happen. You know, that, that concept. Um, and he wasn't sure what to do with that, and about four years later, he and I met uh, here in Brooklyn at a restaurant called Diner uh, in Williamsburg, where Perry was a waiter, and I was a regular. And, uh, and I would talk to Perry a lot when I would come in, and, and we became really good friends, and, and one day over brunch, he mentioned this idea he had, uh, and so we started working on it together. A little while later, we found our third founder, Charles Adler, uh, because a, I was working as a rock critic at the time, and Perry's a waiter, and that's not the pedigree you need for a startup. Um, so we had to find more technical people. It took us a while, and the site finally launched April 28th of 2009. Um, this is where our office is now. This is uh, in the Lower East Side. That's a bar there. We're in those windows up above. I just show this because this, this really kind of defines who we are in a lot of ways. Um, this is our front door. I invite you to try to find our buzzer. Um, people, people get very confused when they come to visit us, but again, this is, this is just a really nice representation of, of us. 
And this is our team. Um, this is our team page on the site. We sit everyone down when they first start, and we try to make them laugh. And then we put together a little animated GIF of this, this looping. So we're, we're 25 people, uh, all packed into one small room. Half the, half the team works on the product designing and building it. The other half works with the community, helping artists create projects and, and think about what they want to do. Um, so that's what I have for you. Now I'd, I'd love to have some of your questions, and, and thanks a lot. Um, well, you know, we wouldn't allow that kind of project on the site because we would view it as charitable in nature. Um, so things along those lines that are, that are, you know, benefits like that, we actually we actually decline. And we do this for a couple of reasons, but a big one is that it's really hard for charity and art to sit side by side. So if you're saving Japan and my project's right next to you and I'm publishing my first book of poetry, you know, you make me look like an asshole without even trying. <laughs> And it's, it's really hard for those things to sit side by side. So for that reason, we just cut it out because we thought creativity deserves its own space. You know, we already feel too bashful about pursuing what it is that we actually care about. Um, so, you know, we crafted this space specifically around that idea. So, you know, obviously that's, that's a, a wonderful and important thing to raise money for, but uh, unfortunately we would not be able to help you. Who else? Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot. It's, it's hard to pick. Um, uh, just the one that came immediately to mind, because it's weird, uh, was Matthew Modine did a project about, he kept a diary on Full Metal Jacket, and it was turning into an, an iPad app. And for $10,000, um, you got to watch Full Metal Jacket with Matthew and have dinner with him. And I just, I really thought somebody really strange must have bought that reward. I just, I, f I felt bad for him for that. But, you know, things run the whole, the whole gambit. I mean, some of this stuff here are some of the best things we've had. But, you know, each project is just, it's someone's imagination just being let loose. So it's always fun to see what they do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly helped. Um, I mean, we... To be honest, we, you know, we haven't been quite sure how we felt about product design projects for a while. It took us a little bit to get used to them. And we were thinking very much in, we're in the, very much in the, in the art mindset. And then we had a project called The Glyph, uh, which is an iPhone 4 tripod stand. And that sort of pushed the boundaries of what we had thought about. But they did such an amazing job. And they thought really hard about how to do it. And that ended up being maybe the best run project we've ever had. And so that's been a great model. And the TikTok, you know, if you talk to Scott Wilson, he'll talk about looking at the glyph, and that's how he made the TikTok. And, you know, so fortunately, fortunately, those good practices have transferred on down. Um, but certainly we've been growing a lot. You know, the past six months have been, have been pretty crazy um, and, and really exciting. So the question was, do we promote projects so we can get paid? And yeah, uh, the answer is no. I mean, I, I, we, we really just don't think that way at all. Like, I, I, I've never looked at a project and tried to do the math about what our take is. Um, it's just not, we just don't care, to be honest with you. Uh, what we choose to highlight is a, is a pretty involved decision by our community team. They sort of editorially decide, so each day, a couple of people spend about an hour looking through the site, figuring out what 10 projects are going to be on the homepage the next day. And there we're just looking to highlight things that, you know, we're just imagining that someone is visiting Kickstarter for the first time that day, and, and what is it they're going to see, and how is it we're going to be represented to them. Um, so we just do our best to highlight the things that we think tell that story. Um, and that's, that's really our, our only interest. Yeah, we should. Um, we, we're weird with that. We, uh, 
you know, we don't have a message board on the site. We don't really have any community tools at all. We, we think the communities on, on Kickstarter are within each project. You know, it's the creator and their backers. And we didn't want to enforce a greater Kickstarter community on anyone who didn't want it. Um, so we've actually really avoided that as much as we can. Uh, but I think that we've lost a lot of opportunity because of that and good chances for people to collaborate, meet each other. And, and that's something that we're looking to change, I think, in the future. Um, I think our relationship to those kinds of projects are different. I think those two kinds of projects are very different. Uh, what we try to counsel with the product design stuff is we say, you know, whatever your, your doodad, your, your whatever it is you're making is not nearly as interesting as you are and as your story is. And, you know, talk about that. Tell the narrative of how you got there and make this a part of it. And, you know, we try to make people sort of see their stories the same way that we do and think about that same spirit. Um, you know, I, we're not going to tell anyone how to do their thing. You know, it's, 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 their, it's their story. But that's what we believe is special about Kickstarter. And that's what we try to reinforce as much as we can. Um, so there are products that do that great. And, you know, it, just because someone's art form is industrial design, whereas someone else's is, is fine art, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily invalidate that person. Um, but I think the relationship is maybe a little different. Um, way back. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, the, the most common pledge on Kickstarter is 25 bucks. The average amount pledged is 70 bucks. So it's, it's generally sort of consumer price point kind of things. Um, rewards can be anywhere from $1 to $10,000. We counsel having a, a wide range of things to think about your broke friends, think about your rich uncles, and all the people in between. Um, the, the Glyph guys, they did a second project called The Cosmonaut, which was a stylus, and they did a, a pay what you want um, model, where they said you can pay anywhere from a dollar to whatever for what you think this thing is worth. You know, we're going to eventually sell it for 20 bucks. Um, and so the average amount they were getting was about $16, and there was some interesting wrinkles to how they did it. Um, but yeah, we like seeing people experiment along those lines. I thought it was, it, it was pretty cool. Um, I'm going to give you guys a, a sneak preview of something really quickly. We'll get into a couple more questions. Um, but last night, um, let's see. Can I get to a web browser here? What's that? Oh, there we go. Um, so we're doing a, um, a Kickstarter film festival uh, with Rooftop Films here in, uh, I got it, in about two weeks. There we go. What, what did I do wrong? Sorry, I'm screwing everything up. So we're doing a film festival on July 9th um, at the, uh, with Rooftop Films. And the project's going to go live next Wednesday. And so last night, the Kickstarter staff, uh, we all stayed late and we got drunk and we decided we were going to make a project video for this together. Um, and I wanted to show it to you now. It'll be going live next week, but this was literally filmed about, I don't know, eight hours ago. Uh, but we're really happy with it. Can we go full screen too? Hi, my name is Yancy. Welcome to Kickstarter. We asked you to come here today because we wanted to tell you about the second annual Kickstarter Film Festival that will be happening July 9th, 2011 on a rooftop in Brooklyn, New York, atop of the Old American Can Factory. It's going to be a special night. We really hope you can join us. We're going to be screening videos from Kickstarter projects. We're going to be, all of us are going to be on hand. We're going to show the best and the brightest of what's happened on Kickstarter so far. We did this last year and it was such a success we had to do it again. We're doing it with rooftop films and we couldn't be more excited about it. So I wanted to bring you into the Kickstarter office and let you see how we're getting ready for this year's festival. If you pardon me, we have to keep it down for just a second. Justin's on a call. This is our conference room here. So we've been studiously preparing for this year's festival. We've been watching every single project video. We've been doing... Sorry, we're still working on it right now. 
But this right here, this is Kickstarter headquarters. Everything happens no, no, here. No, 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 no. From beginning to end, we look at proposals. Yes! And celebrate yeah. success. New Hall of Fame. Looks like they found a winner. So everything that happens at Kickstarter happens here. In this year's festival, we're going to feature 16 films. Documentaries, features, shorts, some project videos, some weird things that we think are really going to blow your mind. If we could just stop right here for just a second. This is my favorite part of the whole office. This is a piece from James Franco's Imaginary Art Project. Is the camera able to pick that up? Do you see? Cool. It's, it's just great. So we've been thinking really hard about how do, we, how do we make this year's festival better than last year's. And you know what we did? We turned to the data and we thought about Let's look at the numbers. Let's analyze how it is that you make the perfect film festival. Let's make a list of all the things that you need to really nail it. And let's make sure we get them exactly right. So we've been working so hard, we've been working tirelessly to make sure that every single piece of this is perfect. Just for you. We really hope that you can make it. We've been testing rewards, making sure they meet our standards for what we're looking for. At the festival itself, it's not just movies. There's going to be project creators. There's going to be fenders there, all people who've made projects on Kickstarter. Mm, <laughs> we think it's going to be an amazing night, and we really hope that you can be here. There's going to be a 500 people here, all your future friends, all watching great films, all joining you together. But it's almost 9 o'clock. It's time to begin. So please, back this project $10 and come join us for the second annual Kickstarter Film Festival. Thank you. Woo! That was really fun, as you can imagine. To everyone's credit, we, at 6 o'clock, we sat down, we tried to figure out what we were going to do. That final take, that was about 9 p.m., so in three hours, we made that up and, and got it. And that was just, the timing for everybody was amazing. It was really fun. Uh, probably a couple more questions, and then right here. Um, I mean, I think the next step is to not screw it up. And, um, and beyond that, I mean, I think that when we started this, the real big idea, the driving idea we had is that, you know, most ideas are just, are just ideas. It's a thing in your head that you want to see exist in the real world. And because trying to get money for those ideas to make those ideas, you have to shoehorn in a revenue model and something that you think will please somebody else. And that just didn't really make sense to us. And we thought there should be a different way. Um, and so it was kind of a utopian notion. I mean, it was a very optimistic view of, of, of human nature, um, but we believed in it, and it's worked. And it's worked in a way that we haven't had to challenge those, you know, those basic sort of ethics, those morals that we really thought about in creating this, and that has made this a lot easier. So when I think about where this goes as, as we continue to grow, I mean, I, I think that we're doing exactly what we dreamed we would be doing. Um, and, you know, I, I can't think of why we would change that. Um, I mean, certainly there are things that can be better, and we will, you know, be iterating, improving on the site and experience and all those things. But I think the spirit, the essence of this thing is, is what we dreamt that it would be, and, you know, we couldn't be more thankful for that. Or our greatest challenge is getting started. The greatest challenge by far is that none of us knew how to code. Um, you know, from the moment that we started working on this in earnest, that was in fall of 2005, and the site launched spring of 2009. And we weren't just chilling for those four years, you know, we were really trying to make it happen. We were going to outside developers, um, you know, trying to hire people on a freelance basis, and that was just a disaster. It was always a disaster, and just the interests were misaligned, you know, we cared about something very different than these, these companies billing you hourly do. Um, and so that was a really, really hard lesson to learn. And uh, what's funny is we would meet with, you know, advisors, people who knew more than we did, and they would say, you can't do outside development, it's impossible. And, you know, our reaction was, whatever, old man, you know, what do you know? Uh, and then we found out that they were right, unfortunately. Um, so that was a really big challenge. Uh, you know, to, to launch the site, we just gave, like, our... 30 or 40 closest friends an invite to start a project and ask them to invite their five friends to do it. That was it. Uh, and that kind of worked out. Um, and as far as, you know, growing or, or running the company, I mean, that we make up as we go along. I mean, this is the first time we've done this. And, but we've been fortunate to just have an amazing group of people who, like, I just could not be prouder of to, you know, to sit in a room with every day. I mean, it's, everyone is just amazing, absolutely amazing. 
And, um, and that's made it a lot easier. So I, I just think up and down the board, we've just been very, very fortunate. Um, and you know, you can only hope that it continues. Anyone else right there? Yeah. Yeah, you know, we have thought quite a bit about that um, and about, you know, local, local projects are really important. I mean, those, are, those people are really willing to jump in to something that's happening on their block or in their neighborhood. You know, it's, it's a great motivator. Um, and, you know, I think the Kickstarter could play a role in, in local government and, and helping maybe fund things that, that the city can't anymore. Um, so certainly we, we're thinking a lot about those things. And, you know, I think over time that might be something that we're able to help out with. Anyone else? Yeah? We did. Yeah, we kickstarted Kickstarter. We really did. Um, our, very, our very first investor was David Cross, the comedian. Um, we had this idea that we were going to use Kickstarter to save Arrested Development. This is at the time Arrested Development was going away. And uh, obviously it didn't work. It didn't work. Um, but Perry, my partner Perry, Perry went to college with David Cross's cousin. We're, we're pretty hooked up. And, uh, and so he managed to get a lunch with David and, and talk to him about this idea. And, and out of that, David became our very first investor. Um, so all of our initial investors, interestingly, were people from the creative community. It was David, it was Chris Kasky, who's the publisher of Pitchfork. Um, it's a couple guys who are in one of our favorite bands. It's a really random group of people. Um, so that got us up to launch. Um, the first year uh, after we went live, no one got paid or, or anything. Um, we were talking to, you know, venture capitalists and that whole thing, and everyone told us no. Absolutely everybody told us no. Um, and then at some point during the first six months or so, we managed to meet um, Fred Wilson and Union Square Ventures, who, if you follow the tech world, you know, they're, they're the best of the best. Um, and we had, you know, we'd read Fred's blog. We dreamt of meeting him at some point, you know, just like anyone who's in that world. And, and we did, and, and they got it. They saw it in a way that, that no one else did. Um, and after that, you know, other people were able to get involved, some really exciting people. Um, so... You know, I don't necessarily know how those things happen. It just, it just kind of worked out. But the beginning, it was definitely, you know, a few people with a piece of paper and not much else. And the only people who could really see what it was that we were seeing were other artists. And, you know, as hard as it was to struggle for those five years, waking up every day wondering, is today the day that the three people who live in Palo Alto who are working on the same exact idea launch their site? I mean, every day we would we'd think about that, talk about that. And... Um, and so to have the, you know, the validation of artists seeing this, an artist who we'd love to have work with Kickstarter, to see that this maybe isn't a crazy idea uh, was something that really kept us going. Um, but that whole part is, is, is really hard. I mean, I have no experience doing that whatsoever. Perry handled all that. I mean, he ended up being a natural at those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a weird part of starting a business. In the back, yeah, either one of you, both. Yeah, I, so before I said that 100,000 people have backed more than one project, and collectively they've accounted, those repeat backers, which we think of as that core audience, uh, collectively they've pledged about 27% of all the money that's gone into Kickstarter. So we'll, we'll just take, that's not really a great number to use for this, but it's as close as we can get. So I would say about 25% of the dollars, 25% of the traffic comes from people who are that Kickstarter core audience. The rest are people coming in because of specific projects. So when your friend starts a project and you get an email to back it, you come and check it out. You know, the thing's flowing on social media. So that's how the site has grown. And so, you know, over time that, you know, that 100,000 will continue to grow and to be, you know, 500,000 a million. Um, I'm not sure if that ratio will always be the same. We, we don't know. Uh, but that, that core audience is, is growing. And right next to you, what was your question, sir?
Yeah, it could go either way. I mean, for something like a web series, you know, I mean, it is a it is a, a specific thing, you know, to fund a season. Um, you know, interestingly, web series alone have raised over a million dollars on on Kickstarter, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so you you could break it down whatever way works for you. Uh, I would say, you know, I generally caution people not to go back to the well too frequently, because you're going to be hitting up the same people, and they're going to be like, really again. Um, so you want to space that out or, or think strategically about, you know, do you want to, I would say you want to make one concerted push, you know, one sprint of 30 days to try to make something happen. And, you know, when that project is going, it's not an easy thing. Like, you're going to get some gray hairs out of it. You're going to have some panic attacks. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a real serious emotional part of your life. But the beautiful thing is, and it's an excuse to talk about yourself and your passion for a whole month, and people can actually have something to do with it, too. It's not just you're telling people about your band, you know. They, there's something that they can contribute that they could be a part of. Um, so actually, when I, when I talk to project creators, you know, there's been over 9,000 successful at this point, uh, you hear over and over and over that the money is rad, of course, but that was not the best thing they got out of it. Really what happened is just putting themselves out there in the world you're just embracing opportunity, and you're just saying, you know, all right, whatever comes of this is cool. So even projects that don't make their goal, there's a story about a month ago, these two guys created this really amazing project where you can just design a character, and then they can fight, like Mortal Kombat. That's a web browser thing. You create yourself, and you can fight, I don't know, a lemur or something. Uh, and it's just a really silly thing, and they put it up, and we loved the project. We loved it so much. They're trying to raise 20 grand, but they just, they did not have an audience. They only raised $500, and we, you know, we, we really got behind it in, in, the, in the small ways we can get behind it. Um, so it, it failed, and it was actually one of those projects that I really lamented. There are about maybe five or six that I think about, and I think that really sucks that that guy didn't make it. Um, but these guys did this. They had the video up, and, and shortly after the project ended and they didn't make it, uh, an investor reached out and gave them $200,000 to start a company to do this full time. They're now based in General Assembly here. Um, and that is not the first time that has happened. That, that has happened at least a dozen times that we know of. So just the act of putting your idea out there, you know, people are looking at Kickstarter as just a place to, you know, not only to find things we want to be a part of, but also to scout things, to look for talent, things along those lines. Uh, just because I started to mention it, the other project, the project that I most regret not happening was one called The Music Man. And it's by this guy, uh, I believe he's out on the West Coast, I believe he's in San Francisco. And you look at this guy clearly just like the tortured artist, and he's been building a robot out of musical instruments for like six years. And he has like the head as part of a violin and like the arms are, you know, stringed instruments. And he's trying to make this moving robot that as it moves will make music. And it's an amazing video, a really amazing story. He just, again, he's a hermit that lives in Illinois and social media was not, was not his friend. Um, <laughs> But that, that's one that I hope will we'll someday find a way to, to, to make it again. So there are, there are some, tragic, some tragic losses. Um, anyone else? Am I, is that time? One more question. Who? There you go. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a huge advantage. I mean, we... We have 25 people. Our marketing department is one person. Kendall, she's the one who crossed out Make a Project video. Um, for us, you know, marketing just means talking to creative communities, talking to RISD, talking to Creative Capital, working with the Whitney, whatever, and talking to them about their artists. Um, you know, we've never bought advertising ever. We've never sponsored anything ever. I don't know that we will. Um, because, you know, people are able to tell the stories on their own, and, and that's so much better than us trying to tell the story. Um, and so we have been very fortunate in that. I mean, I think we hoped that that would be the case, but we weren't counting on it. Um, but, you know, the first thing you do when you start a project, you tell everyone you know. And within that group of friends, you're going to have five more friends who have something they want to do. And so it's just spread out that way, very organically, very much through word of mouth. And, of course, that's, you know, that's everyone's holy grail for how to make something grow. Uh, so we've been very, very fortunate in that way. Um, thank you so much for your time and for listening. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. So awesome. Good job.